Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Cass Business School. My name is Mary Ann Lewis. I am the dean here at Cass, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this exclusive lecture on leadership by William Lewis, CEO of Dow Jones and publisher of the Wall Street Journal. At CAS, we've been at the leading edge of business education now for over 50 years, aspiring to excellence and constantly seeking new ways to serve our students and alumni and shape business practice and policy. In short, we like to say, because we do, enable the extraordinary through knowledge creation, education, and partnerships. And in fact, <coughs> we are here tonight because of just one such partnership. A very important partnership with Dow Jones regarding lessons in leadership. And if I can expand upon that, Dow Jones, P2 Publishers, and CAS recently launched Lessons in Leadership, a certified series of online master classes, and the first online collaboration between a major media organization and a leading business school. Lessons in Leadership is a 16-week program offering nine individual master classes that combine video content from cast thought leaders and real life case studies drawn from conversations that William conducted with leaders of major organizations. Now you might ask, how did this come about? And I would explain it using one of my favorite words, serendipity. Being in the right place at the right time with the right people. Uh, one of the highlights of our 50th anniversary here at CAS was a celebration we held two years ago when then Coca-Cola Company CEO Mutar Kent, one of our graduates, agreed to be interviewed by William and me about the lessons he had learned during his career. The exchange with Mr. Kent, now chairman of the company, was fascinating in many respects. He shared with us how he started working at Coca-Cola actually on the trucks early in the morning, starting at 5 a.m. as part of a management trainee program, and then through his rise in the ranks to leading operations in the Soviet Union and then around the world. But one late lesson in particular <laughs> stood out to us, and that was his emphasis on the importance of being humble. Despite all the power that comes from overseeing a company with more than 700,000 employees in over 200 companies, countries, Mushar was adamant, be humble, spend time with and learn from those who sell, deliver, manage your products, and always carry your own bags. I love that line. You know, at the same time in 2014, I was lucky enough to also meet Peter Price of P2 Publishers, an exceptionally innovative entrepreneur who had experienced developing novel online education in the US. And that combination of Peter's vision of digital education and William in my recent experience with Mutar enabled this idea. Why not offer an accessible online business course featuring insights of the world's leading global business leaders combined with complementary yet challenging curriculum provided by CAS thought leaders. So Lessons in Leadership, CEO Masterclasses and Strategy is really a hybrid. And our ambition is to help students in business. Whether you're currently rising in a corporation or still in education, think strategically rather than the day-to-day -day operations. And tonight, William is going to share some of the insights he gained through those interviews as well as, I'm sure, many others with world's leading CEOs and give you some fa insight into his own leadership journey. This is a fabulous and truly rare <coughs> opportunity to learn from one of the world's most influential media leaders, and I hope you will enjoy his lecture. Trust me, there will be plenty of time for questions. And before I turn it over to him, I do want to give you a bit of a, a background on William. William was appointed Chief Executive Officer at Dow Jones and publisher of the Wall Street Journal in May 2014. He previously served as Chief Creative Officer for News Corp, the parent company of Dow Jones, where he was responsible for the company's creative strategy and developing new commercial opportunities. Prior to joining News Corp, he served as Editor-in-Chief of Telegraph Media Group, which he joined in 2005. And under his editorship, the Daily Telegraph was named UK Newspaper of the Year in 2010 British Press Awards, 
following exposure of the parliamentary expenses scandal. He was also named Journalist of the Year. William holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Politics and Economics from the University of Bristol and is also a proud graduate, oh, oh I sorry, I added the word proud, proud graduate <laughs> of City University of London's prestigious periodical journalism postgraduate degree, a course that I'm sure some of you here tonight are taking at the moment. He is also, or so I've heard, no slouch on the tennis court. True? Uh. Uh, we are delighted to welcome, welcome William here to CAST this evening and thank him for taking the time to share with us his insights. So please, join me in welcoming William Lewis. Thank you very much, Marianne, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, uh, I, I do play tennis, um, but I think that's probably as far as I'll uh, take it. Um, uh, and, and, and that, that those words are particularly kind from you, because not least because you are the real inspiration behind this uh, project. And without you, this wouldn't, without your drive and verve, this wouldn't have, have happened. So thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, and we've loved working with you and all that we've done so far. This is just the beginning. Um, uh, and also I want to thank everyone else from CAST. It's um, been a great team effort so far. You've got a fantastic team and um, feel real momentum behind. I'd like to thank my own Dow Jones team as well, uh, led by uh, Thor, and of course, uh, uh, similarly with Peter as well. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And thank you all uh, for coming, much appreciated. I'll try and make it witty, insightful, and you go away with uh, at least uh, uh, one thing you didn't know before you turned up. Um, uh, and it's lovely to see um, uh, so many old uh, friends here. Not, not actually old, obviously, uh, well, uh, um, but um, uh, sort of, anyway. Um, uh, it is an honor to be here this evening. Um, uh, and as you can probably tell, Marianne and I are so very, very proud uh, of our joint venture, and we really want to sing from the rooftops of London uh, all about it. Um, together we feel that we have created a really cutting edge uh, product that shows the way forward for digital education uh, experiences. Uh, we have, I think, all had enough of the traditional uh, case study way of uh, uh, learning um, and the merging of our exclusive content uh, with CAS's brilliant professors is a, a truly wonderful thing. Um, but we're not here to sell you. Uh, don't worry, uh, but rather to share some learnings uh, from lessons in leadership. And as a reporter, news editor, editor, editor-in-chief, uh, publisher, and, and more likely CEO, I have had the chance over more than 25 years to listen to and try and learn from CEOs. And lessons in leadership encapsulates all of those learnings and more. Um, so, so what does it take to be a successful CEO? My teenage children ask me that very question uh, quite regularly, um, and my strong suspicion is that what they are really saying is that if dad can do it, surely anyone can. Um, that's a fair point. Um, uh, the truth is that being a CEO is actually very much like being a parent. Without patience, you are not going to succeed and most likely run yourself into the ground. But as you will hear tonight in some clips from some of the world's greatest business leaders, successful CEOs tend to focus on ensuring that their organizations are instilled with a compelling sense of mission and direction, that scarce resources are appropriately allocated to support that mission, and when I say scarce resources, I really mean people. The money, the capital can always be found if the mission makes sense. And perhaps the most important role of being a good CEO is making sure that you have the right people with the most diverse backgrounds in the most important jobs inside the company, all feeling motivated and working effectively as a team vitally important. So the CEO, part parent, part social worker. And if you get all that right as a CEO, while still safeguarding the heritage, values, and yes, the soul of the company you are leading, you are well on your way. But please don't forget 
the need to constantly adapt and innovate. For those of you contemplating a career in business, I think it's fair to say that it really is very challenging out there, more so in my mind than for many, many years, given the speed of change and the almost daily pressure to adapt and course correct. Business leaders are, in effect, having to redesign their planes in mid-flight, and that often causes understandable turbulence. According to the Daily Telegraph, my old paper, more than 12 million Britons are forced to take time off work each year because of stress and anxiety, often caused by overbearing uh, and abusive bosses. Academic research in Canada suggests allowing disgruntled staff to stab away at voodoo dolls in the likeness of their boss. Apparently it helps employees feel less resentful and improves the quality of their work. Not that I'm going to be bringing that concept anytime soon to the Dow Jones Executive Committee, but you get the point. And if your own career path uh, ends up or is uh, anything like mine, it will be anything but a straight line. Believe it or not, that is a good thing. Listen, please, here in our first clip from uh, Lessons in Leaders to Australia's richest man, Anthony Pratt, CEO of global paper and packaging giant Pratt Industries. I always tell people life's not a journey, it's more of a washing machine. What does that mean? If it's a journey, it means you, you're not trying hard enough and you're not going fast enough because it's all logical. It's a washing machine. <laughs> Joe Jimenez, who until recently ran Novartis, one of the world's largest drugs companies, adds... I tell every young person that I meet, don't take a linear career path. And I say that because I didn't. I remember early on in my career, a senior manager came to me and he said, go learn new products. I'm going to give you a new assignment that only has two direct reports and no profit. And I thought it was a demotion. But that experience developed me in a way that I never could have been developed if I stayed on the original brand. So the key is to be curious, ask questions, stay true to yourself and remain an independent thinker. You'll then build a framework of principles, principles that can be applied to challenges, big and small. Forge as they must over a lifetime of making a lot of mistakes and reflecting on them. So when we first seriously began exploring the idea of lessons in leadership, for good or for bad, Britain had just voted to exit the European Union. The US was about to install their first CEO president. Perhaps counterintuitively, e economies in both developed and emerging markets were starting to show renewed signs of vigour and global stock markets were about to test all-time highs. But corporate culture and the cult of the CEO remained and remains under the microscope, nowhere more so than here in Britain. The sudden and rather spectacular failure of construction group Carillion has left many uncomfortable questions unanswered, not to mention the downfall of once ubiquitous high street retailers, BHS, Maplin and Toys R Us. A Mark Zuckerberg's MIA positioning in Facebook's spiralling crisis is a really good example of what not to do as a CEO. As the American comedian Dennis Miller once put it, when a big company unexpectedly collapses, you are reminded that not only do the good times not last forever, but that sometimes they never really existed in the first place. And one only needs to read the Wall Street Journal, as I'm sure you all do, it being the world's greatest newspaper, and its in-depth coverage of the rise and fall of the iconic General Electric, to know that once a company starts as a matter of regular practice, flying a spare business jet behind the one carrying the CEO, that adult supervision is lacking. So is another financial and economic crisis lurking around the corner? Recent sabre-rattling over global trade certainly won't help matters. If there were any lasting lessons from the global financial meltdown and Great Recession of a decade ago, it is that corporate disaster is the certain byproduct of a corrosive culture in which the CEO is treated like a rock star. As the oracle of Omaha Warren Buffett says, only when the tide goes out do you discover 
who has been swimming naked. So as we set out to identify potential business leaders for lessons in leadership, we were determined to find CEOs who were fully clothed and more likely than not would remain that way. While the average CEO has a shelf life of less than five years today, the business leader that I had the pleasure of speaking with as part of Lessons in Leadership have all demonstrated an amazing ability to remain at the top of their game over many, many years in industries as diverse as financial services, tech, pharma and advertising, employing over a million people in more than 200 countries around the world with hundreds of millions of customers. So it may come as some surprise that the lesson that all these extremely powerful men and women stressed, as Marianne uh, said, was to be humble. It came through in every single interview that we did. Um, uh, uh, always carry your own bags, as Mukhtar Kent uh, has uh, told us. Or as Barry Stowe, CEO of the North American Business of global UK insurer Prudential PLC put it. Wear leadership lightly. Right. So you surround yourself with very clever people. You create an environment where they can maximize their potential. You create the right sort of collaborative, cohesive culture and good things will happen. Humility is key. Humility is key. Most kept coming back to the same notion, that as global business leaders, they were simply custodians of powerful brands, some like Dow Jones, many more than a century old, and that if you don't have public trust, you have nothing. If you don't have public trust, you have nothing. Something that my industry, the media industry, has had to learn in a hard way in recent years and still very much struggling with today. But having a vision, a purpose, and the trust of the community in which you operate is clearly essential. <coughs> CEOs all agreed it was up to them to set the tone. Here is Jo Ann Jenkins, the first female CEO of AARP, the largest non-profit in the U.S. Most people come to work at AARP because they're passionate about what we do. Uh, it's not necessarily for the money. They've had very successful careers elsewhere, and this is what we call that personal fulfillment moment. I think it's important that people understand what the goal is. I don't necessarily care that you follow the path I'm trying to lay out, but it's more so that we understand what the goal is that we're trying to get to. Now, where that goal or vision sometimes comes from may surprise you. Tech Mahindra CEO C.P. Gunani offered that many of the Indian group's successes are tied to an advisory board of young millennial and post-millennial employees. I take my supervisory board seriously, yeah. but I take my shadow board even more seriously where the average age is 28. So 28-year-old kids, yeah. through a invitation and a selection process mm -hmm. become a board. I have worked out a method that me and my management team actually report to the shadow board. It is not a workers council. Huh. These are young guys yeah. who want to know what we are doing in the company. And CP was not alone. Many CEOs that I spoke to and speak to regularly agree that millennial and post-millennial employees have a tremendous leadership role to play in companies that are serious about innovation and novel ways of addressing new markets. Uh, just last week I spent two days in a rather sweaty room, a uh, dingy room at Cardiff University trying to learn from Generation Z -us, uh, there. Um, uh, uh, everyone has to do it. After all, um, and I can see uh, folk in the room that uh, of the same generation. You are the digital natives. Uh, we are simply digital immigrants in an increasingly confusing world where every company is desperate to become the new tech wonder. Richard Edelman, CEO of the world's largest public relations company, underscores a related point. The reality is we're in a much more social world. Businesses are more accountable than politicians because hmm. the marketplace decision is tomorrow. Hmm. It's not three years from now. Ultimately, the consumer decides. Are they or are they not for real? 
And when the consumer is wrestling with your authenticity, it helps to have a workforce that is as diverse as the community that it serves. Inga Beal, the first female CEO at Lloyd's, the three-century-old global insurance market, speaks, speaks poignantly about the need for diversity, recalling what it took to not only break the glass ceiling, and, but also to carve out a space for the LGBT community. You mentioned earlier the LGBT community. What message would you have for students and professionals who are weighing whether to come out? I would say, do it, do it, just do it. Hmm. When I started work in the 80s, I was a heterosexual female, or so I thought, right? And my only challenge, it seemed at that time, was getting on in a, what felt like a man's world. Hmm. Then later on, I had a relationship with a woman. And then I thought, oh gosh, you know, now I'm a lesbian. Now I've got another challenge. Had to make all sorts of pretenses and I wasn't myself. Yeah. Of course I was less productive because I spent so much time fussing around trying to cover it up. It was taking away energy. And that's why I would urge anyone to really do that because it uncomplicates your life. And most of the time, you will be so surprised how welcoming um, and included your feel. So work out who you are, what you stand for, and be that person all the time. Um, now diversity is the big corporate focus these days, and I can tell you from personal experience that the more diverse a culture, the better the ideas and the increased likelihood of success. But perhaps the most shared conviction, which was really, really fascinating, was also the most obvious, the importance of parents, family and friends. Sir Martin Sorrell talked at length about his family's influence in having the courage to turn a little-known British manufacturer of shopping baskets into WPP, today the world's largest advertising company. My dad said, look, find an industry you enjoy, yeah. build a reputation, and then if you feel like branching out on your own, have a go. Not bad advice. And what of the future, the future that you are all inheriting? Perhaps Cass alumnus Kent says it best. I'd say be even more optimistic than I was. Because I think the world um, is, is an amazing place that offers so much opportunity to young people, more so today than it did when I was growing up. The world is just a place that if we treat it well, the future is so bright. Be optimistic. I can't think uh, of a better note on which to end this talk, so thank you very much. Thank you.